Time for Greg Mettler's, Mettler's? Mettler. Mettler, sorry. presentation, Discovering New Directions in Photography. Greg Mettler's projects range from tra traditional photographic prints to life-size alternative process portraits to video installation examples. His main objective is to use the lens to represent his subject matter in a new context, addressing social, personal, economic, and environmental issues. Originally from the Central Valley, Greg Mettler received his undergraduate degree from Humboldt State and his master's of fine arts from San Jose State. Currently has a studio in San City, California and teaches photography, video and photographic history at Monterey Peninsula College and Cabrillo College. A nationally exhibited artist, Greg continues to push himself to develop new projects that challenge preconceived notions of lens-based artwork. Through alternative processes, mixed media and installation, he pursues photographic projects that explore new ways of seeing the medium of photography. This presentation tonight will cover his various pro projects as well as his influences. So it's my pleasure to hand the meeting over to Greg. Thank you. Thanks for coming. We should just talk about the Anarbus for an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the end. It's the end. I only know that because I saw a video about her mother and referred to her mother as Deanne instead of Diane. So I think cool. right. pretty yeah, and I don't know if anybody saw it or not, but it had to be like 15 years ago. Somebody had made a stencil of that boy with the hand grenade and was tagging it in SoCal in different places, and I kept seeing it pop up. So it was like cool, like photo graffiti. <laughs> My students are always like, I would show Dan Arbus's work all the time, and I mean, talk about it in class, like, why are we drawn to those images? You know, and in today's day and age, it's kind of like, you can't be so cut and dry about like, hey, let's look at pictures of freaks because people are like, well, that's offensive, right? There's people, <laughs> that's an offensive word. But uh, I think we all feel a little bit disconnected from society. So when we see pictures of people that are more obviously not part of mainstream society, I think we have a, a kindredness with those images because there's it re reacts to that part of us mm -hmm. that feels disconnect. <laughs> so that's kind of my way of thinking about her work and how like we can like, conceptualize this idea of like, why are we drawn to these images? So anyways, Mark was asking me to come up with a title because I thought the title would just be Greg Mettler. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like a good title to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was thinking about, you know, I'm, I'm doing a presentation on my work, but kind of what ties it all together. And I think what ties it together is I'm always like pushing to try different things within photography. Um, I, just, I love the medium of photography and I love working my hands. I mean, I, I come from like a farming background and like I like woodworking and I did sculpture and, and I like building things with my hands and I'm really into working in the darkroom and making things, creating installations. So, you know, there are photographers I think that are love to shoot, you know, it's just like they're love just to go somewhere find a new place and take pictures and explore with a camera. I'm more like sitting in my room thinking of things I can make that are related to lens-based photography and then do very little shooting and then take those negatives and then just work and work and work building things. So that's kind of a, so discovering new directions of photography is really just my explorations in my studio in terms of taking the medium that I love and like trying to push it in different directions. It started off just being regular black and white photography, but I would compose things. So like work in a studio and I would make falling leaves and this and then take multiple shots and composite them in the dark room. Mm -hmm. So I was, and I build sculptures and then photograph within those sculptures, but it was straight black and white portfolio, you know? And I, my body of work was matted prints in a portfolio box and I would pull out the white gloves and I would show people my photographs. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the Museum Mechanique in San Francisco. Now it's, I think it's in Port Mason, but it used to be over the Cliff House. But I, I would go in there and photograph those weird contractions, you know, mm -hmm. you put a nickel in and like mannequins would move and shake, oh, yeah. you know, or Victorian houses. So the, a lot of this work was when I was living in San Francisco and working at the underground station, but traditional black and white prints, just um, <laughs> the photographing, just setting up things and photographing. Um, don't forget to mute. <laughs> but a lot of times I'd have an idea in my head of an image that I wanted to create and then I would create it, you know? So it's not like going out on the street and finding things to photograph, but pre-visualizing images that I want to take and then working in a studio or, you know, back then I didn't have a studio. I had an apartment, making my apartment into a studio and then photographing. But I was influenced in 
artists that were using photography like in ways I had never thought about before, like Christian Botansky, take these found these images of children and people pre-World War II, Jewish people that, you know, you don't know what happened to these people, right? And then creating these beautiful installations with these images about, you know, and just how the photograph tied into an image. You know, the Starn Twins, like I saw this, I don't know, this showed, I think this image might have been at UCSC a long time ago, but I remember seeing it on the wall and just being blown away, like this idea of an installation of photographs is tactile and put together and super inspired by a video. It's like Bill Viola and William Kentridge and just, you know, so I'm looking at all these different art forms and I'm thinking like, what about my black and white? What about my photography? Like, how can I push it in different directions? So my first real exploration and trying different things is when I was living in San Francisco, I was working at a photo store. So I don't know if anybody remembers Adolf Gasser's. I was on second admission a long time ago. So I was working at Adolf Gasser's and uh, just, I was working in the rental department and I was just, but experimenting. I had a little studio set up at Ocean Beach and I would just start experimenting. And I bought a bottle of photo emulsion, which is light sensitive black and white emulsion. And you can put it on different things. So I started experimenting, applying photographic emulsion onto canvas. So like this piece is uh, 23 by 23 inches. There's another one over here when the lights go on. It's the same sort of thing. So you know, we won't get into all the technical aspects of how we do this, but real simply, you can apply it onto substances and then you can take that substance and expose it with light, like a traditional black or white print, and then run it through chemicals. So I was running chemical canvas through developer and stop math and fixer and then washing it and stretching it. And I liked that you had this combination of the gestural quality of painting, the brush strokes, mm -hmm. but this photographic image that comes through, you know, and it's this really interesting, I think interesting way of looking at photography where you have the combination of those two. Because when you look at a painting, for me at least, I always think of the artist first, the gesture, like the person applying paint onto there. But when I think of photography, it often bypasses the artist and it goes right to a particular place, a moment in time. So like this combination of having the gestural quality of the artist and that gut human response we have when we view photographs, because of course it's tied into all of our existence, our history, our memories, license are wrapped up in photography. I thought it was a good combination. So I just started experimenting with taking images and applying them on canvas. But also, but I still tying back to this earlier idea of like images that I would come up in my head and then create. So this image was called the saddest gift, or it is called the saddest gift. And um, I took white leather and I took black monofilament and I cut it and sit, made it look like sutures. And then I photographed a picture with just the stitches against white leather. And then I photographed my hands and then the darker my superimposed the stitches into my hands. And the, the concept was it at that time, it was like, I felt like I had a lot of people in my life that were like, you know, like they give you their pain as like a present. Like I did this for you, <laughs> like guilting you, you know, like giving you their pain. You're like, you can just keep it. <laughs> you know, I don't want your, I don't want your sadness. I don't care. So that's kind of just a idea behind that. This is the one that's here for the clearing. So I just went on this explore. This is in Lodi off of Highway 99. And a uh, quick story, I was I was driving and I saw this, right? I mean, if you see that, right? The motel, old motel with the, after the rain with a reflection on the ground, like I have to <laughs> photograph this, but it's, a, it's not the kind of motel that you take your kids on the way to Disney. Like, <laughs> it's a CD motel and I got my camera and my Hasselblad out and, you know, I didn't know the right exposure. So I just, you know, you should bracket, like just even longer and longer and longer exposures. And so I'm doing like, eight second exposure, like a 16 second exposure, a half a minute. And a guy comes out of one of these rooms, like jumps the fence and starts coming. <laughs> Cause he didn't want me photographing for whatever. I just grabbed all my stuff and took off. <laughs> I brought this one too. I used to also carry my camera everywhere I went when I was younger and then would photograph like high speed film. And then I made a ton of these little small prints that were printed full frame, just like Nightlife in San Francisco and Stockton where I grew up in different places. At least some of these are here. Hmm. So great. Yeah. 
just sort of, I, I think you didn't mention, Kevin didn't mention that you welcome questions anytime. So yeah, if anybody has questions, just yeah. feel free to ask them. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, the earlier, the one that's up, that's here, the clearing. Uh huh. Uh, whose feet are those? My wife, so she was my girlfriend at the time. But I just had the idea of, you know, somebody walking through the forest at night or through the Golden Gate Park at night, you know, like I always spend so much time in Golden Gate. It's kind of scary sometimes. And I imagine, like, I don't know, being a woman barefoot at night walking through that park, you know, it just seemed like an unsettling image. Uh -huh. So I went to San Francisco or I went to the Golden Gate Park and I just piled my a garbage bag full of eucalyptus leaves and everything, sticks and stuff. And I went back to my studio or my apartment. And put black plastic down and create a floor and then set up some lights and then get pictures of my wife Sandy walking through it. <laughs> are, are these photo markings versus Kodak and it's the film type? Is that uh, original or is that superimposed later? No, that's original because this member is done just with an enlarger. Okay. So, yeah, this is just, you know, take you take 35 millimeter film and then you can use like a a bigger carrier for like two and a quarter, and then you can print a full frame where you see the actual edges of the film. So yeah, they're printed full frame. And I think also printed in full frame kind of created like a more of a movie still yeah. feel to it. This is a show I had in San Francisco at the Meridian Gallery, it's not there anymore, but it was on Sutter and Powell, and you can see how some of these like really large prints would look in a, in a gallery type setting. That was my first like major, major show. You can also do it on wood. So, and the wood has a different feel, the kind of the, the way that the emulsion sits on top of the wood and they're smaller and plaques, but uh, you know, experimenting with different substrates and putting the photo emulsion. You know, and it is kind of interesting because it makes the images more like an artifact and less like a print, you know, and that I kind of like that too. You know, with photographs, we're always dealing with additions and how many we're going to print out, you know, and they're like perfect replicants of each other, right? You don't want to sell somebody edition number two and then number 10 looks different. But working in this way, every time I made a print, it was a completely different thing. You didn't have to addition it because it looked completely different, different from the other print that you made. So each one's an original image. And then all the little errors in it start to become interesting. The places where the emulsion scuffs off add to the photograph, you know? And that was also refreshing too, because as some of you know, us photographers can get so into everything being so perfect <laughs> that, you know, it's like, oh, there's dust, there's this, there's that, you know, like, oh, I didn't notice this. There's that little black dot in the sky and it's driving me crazy. It's like freeing myself from all that where it can just be like this loose sort of printing. My, I said my family are all farmers from the Central Valley, so I took a bunch of my grandfather's really old tools out of the shed and then documented the tools. These are on wood as well? Uh-huh, these are on wood. This is from a show in San Francisco, a group show, but you can see how some of these wood plaques would hang on a wall and display them. That's why you put a fence around. I took like bailing wire and nails just to create like kind of these borders. So scope of feeling means the love of looking. And I had this idea, this is when I was later. So I, I went to undergraduate and then I moved to San Francisco and I did commercial photography and was a working artist for 10 years in the city and then moved down to Marina and started teaching a little bit and decided I really loved teaching and then decided to go back to graduate school. So I went to graduate school in my thirties after I'd already had a bunch of years working. And then when I was in graduate school, I started working on some different projects. And one of them was scopophilia, the love of looking. So when I would go into museums and galleries, I would see these like life-size sculptures, these big sculptures, and they had such a beautiful aura to them. You could walk around them and they had a presence you know, photography to me felt like a picture of another place at another time. So I started thinking like, is there a way to like create photographs where they have more of a presence like that in a gallery setting where they feel like, you know, so I had this idea like, I bet if I print life-size nudes on canvas and have them in a gallery, it would be different. You know, people will experience a different sort of way of looking at photography. So um, 
I'm like, okay, I want to do news. By that time, I was in graduate school, and there was a lot of talking about the male perspective and this idea of how men define women's sexuality. You know, of course, there's lots of photographers. There's lots of the history of photography. So there's a lot of men photographing naked young women on rocks and that sort of thing. So um, I thought, like, what's a way that I can just, like, kind of be a little bit, I guess, more subjective about the photography. So I just put an ad on Craigslist and I said, find our photographer looking for nude models, all ages, body types and genders, 18 and over. And then I just photographed everybody who answered the ad and came to my studio. And it was a bizarre social experiment. You know? <laughs> like if you put an ad out to get people to random strangers to pose naked for you, people do it for all different reasons. It was really interesting. You know, some people were in way into art and they just thought like when I, I would meet with everybody ahead of time to have coffee and be like, this is my idea. Are you, you know, instead of just like show up in my studio and get naked. It was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to photograph. And then, but some people were just in art and they liked the idea and they did it. So a lot of them were models that like, were like, well, if I do this for you, will you do headshots for me for their portfolio? And then there was a lot of exhibitionists that just wanted to get naked for a stranger because they enjoyed it. <laughs> So I printed them and then that same process, but I was doing them life-size on canvas. And um, to fix one of those, it would take uh, 10 gallons of fixer to fix the life-size. <laughs> but I just photographed everybody who showed up and then I photographed about 10 different people and then narrowed it down and showed them like this where they're on the ground. So you would come in and you would like stand as of these life-size people with you know life-size genitals and they're like looking up at you and you don't know whether it's supposed to be alive or dead and I wasn't a hundred percent sure like that what it was completely about I just knew I wanted to do it and then it was really interesting to hear all people's different experiences when they're looking at them because you know when you show nudity like that people take their their history around nudity and then they like is it about this is it about body is it about gender is it about all these things like I don't know I just yeah. made them but it was really interesting to hear everything that people had to say about them. And it was kind of a good graduate school experience to like have a show like this and then get response from people in terms of what they thought about the work. Are there other things being shown at the same time in this, in this venue? Uh, there was other galleries that were showing work, but that was the only thing in this gallery. Also, this is my first experience with installation, right? Not putting work on the walls in traditional photographic formats, but thinking about the space and how three-dimensional things will live within a space and people will walk into a space and then how they would experience artwork in a space. Great. Yeah. Were you in San Francisco or Marina when you did the fall? Hello? I was in Marina and at that time I had a studio in Pacific Grove. Yep. I photographed all the Grove. Yeah. Yeah. Area. Yep. And did you did you direct it all when you were photographing like eyes closed open or let them do what they I had them lay on the ground. And I had a black clock down and I said, just lay like you're sleeping. And then I would I measured people, which is kind of weird, but I would measure it. <laughs> Let me step back. I measured the width from their shoulder to shoulder. So then when I printed them, I printed them exactly that like size, shoulder to shoulder. So I should have said that in a different way. Not thinking the large is big enough to do those. I mean, those are single frame. Yeah, so I shot them with Hasselblad and then I arranged my Hasselblad. So they're diagonal on the frame of the Hasselblad to get them as big as I could on the negative. And then I have a, a wall mounted enlarger that oh, was like right up the and ceiling, yeah. project down on the floor. Gotcha. Yeah. How did you suspend your camera over them? I had an arm mounted on the wall that hung over, and then I had a ladder mounted, and I like kind of like lean way over. <laughs> and so, uh, and had a camera release. Yeah, I would, well, I would go to the viewfinder first, like stand under a viewfinder and get my focus right, uh -huh. and then meter my light and everything, and then I then the person would lay down, and then I would okay. I would know it was set, and then I would use a camera release to fire off the shot. Are they printed in segments? No, it was one it's big print. One big long roll or whatever. It was all stretched. So it was like, I, I would stretch a giant canvas, oh, canvas right. and then put a motion on the canvas and expose it all at once. Are you, are you making smaller test prints? Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yes, I would, but I would have to stretch the canvas the same width yeah. so that when I put it under there, it would, the focus would be right. Oh. So I'd make smaller stretch canvas mm -hmm. and I'd coat them ahead of time. 
And so, and then half of them didn't turn out. And each time they didn't turn out, it was a couple hundred dollars worth of chemistry and stuff that I yeah. put in the garbage can. Yeah. But I was happy with the work. I think for me at that time, it was just a really interesting experience. They did, I did um, get, there's me, because I'm younger with dark hair. Yeah. Fill them diagonally. Did you then have to fill in around the edges to? Uh, yeah, I would have sometimes a negative, the edge of the negative would fall off in the corners, but it was all black. So I would just burn it in. You just burn it in. Yeah. Yeah. So old fashioned water color. You see me a long time ago in between those two ladies. Black shirt and gray pants. Yep, and gray and yeah, not, not all white hair. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, I was asked to be in a show in Kentucky with this work, so we shipped it all to Kentucky cool. in Lexington, and then had an exhibition there, and it was really cool. It was like a, a giant. It's like an old mansion that had turned into this big show, and they would. Um, it was all about the news, and so they would. Uh, I would. That guy in the corner was working for the gallery, and I didn't know this, but he was asked to um, make sure that nobody slept on him because I priced him like eight thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so like, they didn't want their insurance to have to deal with that. So I slept on him, and everybody's getting drunk, right, and walking around him. Well, those two ladies were writers, and they asked me how those, uh, their, how they were being, they were like suspended off the ground with these pegs you can't see. And I lifted one oh. up, and. I, Almost tackled me because oh, he thought I didn't know I was the artist. So I was like, right off the ground. Did anyone buy one? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're still for sale. <laughs> they want to license me. Um, <laughs> 18 minutes. Okay, I have time for another story. Did, did you compensate the, uh, your models? Yeah. Yeah. I paid them by the hour. It was $25. Just kind of like, and I shot for like two hours. So not a lot of money, but. I would say, though, from a professional standpoint, it's very nice to have a signed model release. And on that model release, you notated that you paid them and there's a check number and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's uh, it's always nice. With dealing with news and things, you know, just so it's, it's nice to have that document. But you were paid, you got paid, you signed this, all that. Mm -hmm. um, they did ask. So there was a show, an alternative process show. I don't know, some of you may remember quite a few years ago at the Pajaro Valley Art Center. And uh, a friend of mine, Hedwig, she was curating the show and she wanted to show a couple of these news, the, the life-size ones. And so she came to my studio and she picked one male and one female nude. And then they put the show up and they had them in the front room leaning up against the wall. And um, the male nude and the female nude. And it all looked awesome. And then I came back for the opening and they weren't there anymore. They were gone. And uh Hedley said, well, the, the the art committee or the people in charge came through and they saw the life size male nude and they felt like it was not appropriate to have that in the front gallery when people walked through. Mm -hmm. So they put them in a separate room mm -hmm. in the back. <laughs> and that separate room in the back had beads <laughs> on the doorway. So if you want to see the life size nude male, you had to like <laughs> like, well, you don't remember like the old yeah. video room at yeah. the yeah. porno room at the video store? Yeah. So they made the, which I thought it was, that was interesting too, that like the male genitalia had to go behind the beams. Because the beams, they didn't care. They didn't care about, didn't care about that. It was all nudes all over, you know, they all over the place. So, I mean, it kind of just tells you a little bit. Was yours the only male? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this kind of segues. Um, <laughs> bear with me here. This might be a little graphic, but it kind of goes to like my mind, like how I think about things. Um, when I lived in San Francisco for a while, I used I worked at Gasser's, and then I started working at Calumet. Do you remember Calumet? That was on 16th and Bryant in the in the Mission, and I lived at 20th and Florida, so I had like a two block walk every day from my apartment to Calumet, where I worked full-time Italian selling film. And um, I would do that walk. And every day I saw this uh. everywhere. Cause there was, it was where I lived, there was no street lights. And so people would pick up um, sex workers on mission and then they would drive to my neighborhood and then they would have sex and then the condoms would be there in the morning. And me being a weird photographer, I'm just like, 
I'm just gonna photograph them. <laughs> so I had my hospital blood, my hospital blood with a macro lens. The whole thing was like this long, and I would get up early in the morning and I'd be out there <laughs> photographing these condoms, used condoms. I just thought they were interesting because it was part of my daily experience, and they were like had these markers of these things that were happening at night. Yeah. I knew they were gross. It wasn't like I was trying to say like, oh look how beautiful they can be. <laughs> they were, I mean, they were gross, but at the same time, they were interesting to me. And it, honestly, at that time, I just would get them printed. There, I shot them color negative, and then I would get them color prints. And I just had like a shoebox full of them that I would just every once in a while show people, like, look at these weird pictures I'm doing. You know what I mean? But I had no real intention of like showing them as like art. It was just, you know, sometimes it's just interesting to photograph things for me. <laughs> so, what does Nemesis mean? So, at the time, I don't know if you remember, but it, that was during the dot-com phase in San Francisco. And they'd taken a bunch of old industry buildings and turned them into dot-coms. Wow. And so they renamed that neighborhood the Northeastern Mission Industrial Section. Oh, and then after the dot-com phase, out, nobody called it that anymore. <laughs> so I had all these pictures of condoms. Then I got into graduate school. I had photographed them years earlier. I got into graduate school and they're like, Oh, you want to have a show? Is there anything? And they knew I had shown the San Francisco things. So like, is there anything that you haven't shown before? <laughs> uh, well, I have. I have this work. No. So I scanned the negatives and then I printed them big, like twenty-three okay. by twenty-three inches. And then I put. It was in an all-black gallery, and then I put a pedestal in the middle of the gallery, and I kind of marked. Kind of where I shot the condoms. <laughs> and then I put number of mat tacks on the wall. So you go in and you look at the condom on the wall, and then you would go to the pedestal and you think visualize <laughs> that area. And so, but I had them up there and I thought it was kind of cool. But then the feedback was always like, well, I don't know what this is about. Are you just trying to shock us? Is it just gross? Like, I don't know what it's about. And it made me think about it more. Like, well, what is it about? Why, why did I take them? What's interesting about them? Why would I want to show them? And I started thinking about the area in which I lived. How like there was condoms everywhere, but then you go a couple blocks in a different direction and there's like no condoms. I mean, where I lived, there was condoms everywhere. There's heroin needles everywhere. It was just like, and I was paying a lot to live in that area. And there was families that lived in that area where their kids are like kicking their soccer balls over heroin needles. But you go two blocks in a different direction in San Francisco and it'd be nothing, right? So I was thinking about how cities were like that, where you'd have like an area where money come into it and they would rebuild gut these buildings and they would build all these new high rises and sell them for millions of dollars. And all these people would come in all of a sudden, all the crime and all the prostitution and drug use would just get pushed into a different neighborhood. It's not like they were going in and building halfway houses and community centers and addressing what was happening on the streets. It was just like, there's money here now, so go to over there. You know, and I lived in areas that were over there where all that stuff was so prevalent. Mm -hmm. So then I thought of the condoms as like a form of marker of gentrification. Oh. <laughs> so then I'm like, what can I do different with this idea of the condoms? So I had this idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I would buy I would buy condoms at the store, and then I would take them. And I would take them out of the wrapper and shape them like they were on the street. And then I would make a mold of that condom. And then I would pour wax. And then I would turn it into a bronze investment. <laughs> so and so then it turned into kind of the sculpture project. And then I would take those condoms and I would place them in areas. And I would photograph it and I would leave it. And on the bottom, I would stamp www.bronzecondoms.com. And I created a website that talked about like how our cities are gentrified and how <laughs> so I'd leave it on the street and I photograph it and I walk away and sometimes I watch it take a little while but somebody come up and they'd be like they always did the same thing they take it yeah. <laughs> that's like metal and then they take out their cell phone and they take a picture of it and then they look around. And then they grab it and put it in his pocket. <laughs> and you know, what are you going to do? Not go to the website? Yeah. <laughs> of course you go to the website, right? And then when people would answer the website, most of the time they'd answer, they'd be like, yeah, I found your condom. I think this idea is kind of interesting. I'd say, can you please put it somewhere else that you think is gentrified and take a picture of it? So they would take a, put it somewhere else and then they would take a picture of it. 
And then that person would, you know, and they started to move <laughs> around. So people are like, oh, this, I went to Portland, I put some here, I went to Seattle, I put some here. Like, so then it's kind of this idea of all these cities are becoming more gentrified in terms of like the has and the has not, like gated communities without crime, and then everyone else condensed in these little areas. So. How far did they go? Yeah. I'll show you. Oh, okay. <laughs> So they would go to it and you click on like, did you find one? And I would talk about my idea, like which one did you found? And then there'd be information about that one. How many did you make? Seventy. <laughs> and I actually I have some later. <laughs> and are they also still for sale? Uh, they were never for sale. <laughs> and I think it would be against the idea of them to sell them, right? It's like yeah. this is like my idea of public art, like you know, they this idea. Different prices in different areas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So there's San Francisco. I put one in San Francisco at the by that the John Roloff sculpture out in front of the museum, the money or the SF MoMA, that, that boat that sticks up. Mm -hmm. Downtown San Jose. That's Union Square. I love that that lady's like shopping and is in that little nook and she just <laughs> doesn't even know. These are ones other people put. So somebody found, put one in Stockton, which is interesting because I'm from Stockton. Someone put one in Denver. Someone put one in New York next on the ground next to this bronze George Washington plaque. <laughs> Vatican City. <laughs> so they migrate around. Now they saw, I mean, I think the last, I did it in like 2008, seven or eight, something like that. And I think like around, 2014, I stopped, they finally stopped getting. The last one I got was South Carolina. I don't picture that, but the last one was like somebody found one in South Carolina. But now they've kind of settled, eventually they've settled and people have them, you know? Because yes. <laughs> I might, if I found them, I'd be like, I'm keeping it. <laughs> they set off metal detectors when it goes in here. Right, but, yeah. How do you explain that one? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you have to yeah. take, it take a while to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, show I had around 2012, 2011, uh, I was in uh, Modern Museum of Art, and um, I was really interested, is there, has anybody been to the camera sphere at the Cliff House? So you pay two bucks to go in, and you would see, like, you know, you get this rotating view, like this 360 degree rotating view. You know, they put camera series everywhere for a long time as I first traction. But it's so voyeuristic and interesting to be in that place and, like, see this 360 degree vision. So I had this idea and I drew this picture and I proposed it to the director of the Modern Museum. I'm like, I wanna build a fake camera obscura inside the museum. But instead of having like a rotating lens on top, I wanna mount, I wanna shoot video and I wanna have a, a video, a digital video projector on top. And I wanna like people can go in my little hut and see a projected 360 degree vision of where I live. So I thought I wanna create video of Monterey County and then create this video and then build this installation. People go in. So they approved it. And I started building. And then I thought it'd be cool to cover it in tin, because you know the history of the tin cannery and everything going on down there in Monterey. And so I was shooting at the dump by downtown Carmel. of Monterey County. So people would, this is what a, the installation would look like. And then you would go in and you'd watch the video. And I just wanted to show like, you know, cause people come to Monterey and they think it's all, you know, saltwater taffy and coffee. All of you do. There's a very like purposeful transition coming up in period like that. I really like to talk about the variety of modern county. Like, very different lives. So that was like a, that was kind of cool. And it was like a, like, and to live in Monterey County. And then when it went over, it was kind of done and moved on to something else.
I've, I've been experimenting sometimes with encased photographs. So building cases and putting photographs inside of them. So like, the, you know, I always think about like the stereotypes and old photographs, how like at one point people would have just one single photograph of somebody like a loved one, you know, it's the only photo they have of that person, maybe even been like a post-morbid or more to like picture, you know, because it's all you had of that person. And it's like your precious key. Or that the idea of like somebody having like a locket with their love in it. It's like the only picture they have of that person. Like the preciousness of a photograph to have it in a case. So then I thought like, how can I recreate photographs that are bigger? Like these are 20 by 24 inches, but it had that same idea of like, and then I thought it'd be really, I never did it, but I always thought it'd be really cool to have a show where you have like 20 of these things and half of them are open on one day when the gallery's open and then people come in like, what's up? Can we see the other ones? Like, no, you have to come on Thursday. To do that. <laughs> so play with that idea of like, why can't I see it? Why can't I see it now? It's like, oh, well, the artist only wants you to see it on Thursday. <laughs> what's so important? You know, the, the preciousness of the photograph, that, the way that like something very special that's hidden and close up. But I only made like two of them and I never made more. But I do visit the idea sometimes. I've been working uh, on creating prints that are more sculptural. And so these are black and white prints. This image is about this tall. And it's what I took is a wine barrel hoop. So my family are grape growers. So I took a wine barrel hoop and I created a frame and then I made a photograph and I sunk it into the frame and then I poured a pox of resin over the top of it to create this kind of ovals that I, they're kind of like of my, related to my family history and my idea around work and growing up around farms. They're kind of like my mind's eye. I kind of feel like that oval is like images from my mind. I brought, if you want to like for a second, here's a more recent one. So this is the same sort of thing, a black and white print under epoxy resin. Hold it in front of the camera on the laptop. So you can kind of see how, and it really like, for those of you that are black and white printers, you know, like when a print comes out of the fixer and it's wet, you're like, oh, it's so rich. It's, but sometimes they dry down and they don't look as great. But then when I pour resin over the top of it, it gets that, that look again, mm -hmm. that richness to it, so. You can come up and look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll skip ahead, but I've been working with just photographs like that. How did you attack, connect with a place in Arkansas? Uh, I knew somebody, just a friend of mine that was a professor over there and they invited me to have a show. The last one I'll show you, then we're almost out of time, is the last thing I've been working on is the moving cyanotype. So I teach alternative process and you know, cyanotype is a 19th century process, the blueprints and also teach video. So I had this idea like, can I combine this idea of hand printed photographs into video? So I took some video of just a former student of mine. I had him walking out of the darkness into the light and turning around and walking back. And I shot it as digital video. And then I exported every frame of the digital video and then I turned it into uh, black and white, and then I inverted it and made it a negative and printed them out as digital images. And then I printed every single frame as a cyanotype. <laughs> and then I rescanned every single image and put it back in the video. So now every frame that I, of the video is all turned into a hand printed frame. <laughs> and then compile them all back together. And then I had an exhibition a couple of years ago where you'd walk in and all of the frames of the video are on the wall. Mm. And then around the corner was the actual video. And I'll show the video for you.
again, look at his face, but like I knew he was. In the gallery, it's on a loop, so he could have been dark. Wow. It took two years to make one minute of video. <laughs> well, did you put sound on? I thought I did the sound of footsteps. Yeah, so I took the original. Yeah. And, right. matched, okay. and matched it up frame by frame. So that is the actual sound of uh, the speech shuffling in and out. I think we're about out of time. That's probably a good place to stop. Uh, cool. Any other questions? Uh, I have two questions, actually. Thank you so much.